Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, me again, Dwight, here on 153greatfish.website. A lot to talk about tonight, and uh, so let's go immediately to prayer to Jesus. Lord, we love you, God. We praise you, Jesus. We ask you, Lord, to anoint our study and open up our understanding to everything you want to say to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're finally getting to the end of this course, okay? I'm going to switch to the PowerPoint right now. Uh, we're getting to the end of this course, The History of Israel, The Foundations Bible Study. This will be Lesson 13, okay? Here's the objectives of the course. You can stop this video right here and take a look at those objectives. And it is Thursday, April 7th, and we're going to talk tonight about a lot of things, but we're going to end with the Zedekites of Qumran. This is Lesson 13 of 13. This will be the last lesson on the Foundations Bible Study. Uh, I encourage you to go through Lessons 1 through 12 before you get to this point. It will help you to understand your Bible better and a little bit more about Israel. So let's talk about this uh, topic. Here's the outline. The Restoration 1 of Israel began in 539 B.C. and ended around 424 B.C. Our second point will be that there's a second restoration from 424 uh, B.C. to 30 A.D. A lot of people don't understand that actually the time of Jesus and John the Baptist is still the Old Testament because the day of Pentecost ushered in the New Testament. That's when the church was born on the day of Pentecost, 33 AD, somewhere around Sivan 6, that's the Jewish calendar, sometime in June normally, the day of Pentecost. A lot of churches celebrate Pentecost Sunday. So when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you are actually reading Old Testament scripture, although you've never been taught that uh, you've been taught that it's the New Testament, but uh, in reality, John the Baptist and Jesus are the two witnesses, the Old Testament prophets, that are ushering in a new kingdom. Uh, then we have a period of literary si silence from 424 to 30 AD. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk about the Second Temple period. Uh, most people recognize this period from about 175 BC to 70 AD, the Second Temple period. And then we're going to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Zadokites. The word Zadok means righteous. If you recall from one of our previous studies that Zadok was made priest in the, in the, instead of the lineage of Eli, which happened uh, around the kingdom uh, when Solomon was uh, anointed king. Uh, David and Solomon did that uh, together. Eli's family was completely wiped out and removed from the high priesthood, the Cohens. In 1947, this was the day of Israel's rebirth. We're going to talk about that. So... Let's get going. Let's review for last week. Uh, we, we said that the major literary prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve Minor Prophets, they all agreed that the defeat of Israel in exile, both the northern and the southern kingdom exile, are evidence of God's universal sovereignty. Not only does he control Israel, he controls all the nations. And they get a just punishment to bring the remnant back to covenant. Now that's an important point. God's mission is to bring a remnant back to covenant because they had all fallen out of covenant. And uh, he does this through covenant renewal. Yahweh, God is not weak. He chastises those he loves. So that's the other major point. And the prophets point this out, that their moral purity had gone downhill. Syncretism had creeped in and defiled the people. The covenant had been abrogated. God goes into exile with them. Uh, so... There's two ways that the literary prophets differ from exegetical history. Remember we said that this unit from Deuteronomy to through 2 Kings should be read as the exegetical history of Israel. It should be read like a single book. So there's two ways that the prophets, the literary prophets, that is those that write, those that wrote things down, this is how they differ from the history. One, God punishes not just for idolatry, but also for its companions in immorality. Remember the rule is that idolatry always precedes immorality. You can't have a Las Vegas or a Hollywood until you have a Wall Street and a New York. So God punishes not just for those two things. He punishes because of a violation of ethical monotheism. And ethical monotheism can be defined as love the one God first and love all your neighbors and strangers as you love yourself. That's ethical monotheism. And the second way that the prophets differ is that they emphasize a future restoration and a glory of a remnant. A remnant. And God is not interested in a crowd. He's interested in a church. You can have a, a million people at a crusade, but if it's not truth, it's just a crowd. So Restoration 1 and 2, we're going to talk about it. Here you'll see in the Museum of, of Notre Dame in Paris, at the Notre Dame, you'll see a, uh, uh, a, a statue of King David uh, made in many, many uh, 
centuries ago. And here you'll see to the right the Cyrus Cylinder. This is written in Akkadian, which is a cuneiform script. Uh, it's from 539 BC recounting uh, the victory of Cyrus over the Babylonians. And that was an interesting story into itself. I'm not going to go into that, but you can read about that in the Old Testament. But uh, Cyrus talks about the restoration of all the religions, including the Jewish religion. And it was the Persian king, King Cyrus the Great, who began the initiative to restore people that had been uh, illegally immigrated into Babylon. He's going to restore them to the original lands along with their religions. And that's how he's going to set up his kingdom uh, in that sort of distributed fashion. So let's, let's get into it. The kavod, or the glory of God, the Shekinah, the rabbis call it, which is not a biblical word. They invented that word. It leaves the temple and it joins the exiles over the Mount of Olives in 586 B.C. Ezekiel saw this vision. We talked about that. The temple was then destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. They burned it, ground, burned it to the ground. They carted off many of the holy vessels from the temple to Babylon. And we see those vessels reappear just the evening uh, before uh, uh, Cyrus the Great and his captain Darius go through the, the uh, Tigris River, they go through the Ishtar Gate, they uh, have a fifth column of people waiting to help them subdue the Babylonians, and of course uh, the Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, he sees the handwriting on the wall, uh, many, many Tekla Safarian, and uh, uh, your days are numbered. Restoration 1, the Persian freedom in 539 BC, of course, we have the Declaration of Cyrus, but then the, the uh, re restoration, the remnant begins to return between 536 and 334 BC. So 536 is when they're freed, 334 is when Alexander the Great conquers the Middle East, the, the Levant, it's known as Levant, uh, all of Mesopotamia to the Great Sea, down to Egypt. So a remnant returns according to the Isaiah 10:22 prophecy, 42,360 people are accounted for in Ezra 2, 6-64. And uh, this period of time is from 536 to 516 B.C., I think. And uh, they also create the synagogue system while they're in Babylon, the way to worship without a temple. So Cyrus is called a Messiah by Isaiah. He's actually named in prophecy. Isaiah 45, 1-5. And of course, scholars would like to refute this, that they would like to say this was written uh, right, be, uh, right after Cyrus took over and the Jews wrote it in their scriptures because they can't believe in the foreknowledge and the foretelling of God. But this scripture uh, was out there, this passage, foretelling the name of Cyrus, and certainly the Jews showed it to Cyrus before he restored their temple. So Cyrus issues the decree to return. It's found in two places in the Bible. I think I said uh, incorrectly last week it was Isaiah 36. It's actually 2 Chronicles 36. These two verses in Ezra 1 through 4, if you want to read Cyrus's decree, there it is recorded. And then the second re uh, restoration happens during the period of Greek and Roman assimilation, 323 B.C., Alexander the Great uh, dies, and then, of course, 33 A.D. is the advent of Jesus Christ, uh, when he presents himself for coronation as their messianic king. So let's go through the Persian kings to help us understand um, who was ruling, and we can get confused by the, some of the same names that are used uh, more than once in the, New, in the Old Testament. So here's the outline that uh, secular uh, archaeologists have determined from 539 to 530 B.C. is Cyrus, of course his Persian name is Koresh, and the Jewish temple rebuild begins, but it's delayed and slowed down. It's not until Cambyses uh, becomes uh, emperor that they uh, begin in, in 520 through 516 to get it done. So, I'm sorry, Darius the first. So there the temple's completed, it takes about three and a half years. That's how long it takes to build a temple. That's how long Jesus and John the Baptist witnessed during their period, their, their intertestinal period. And that's the period of time in Revelation of the two witnesses. 46 to 464, Xerxes, Ahasuerus, that's the Queen Esther and Haman. I believe it was the book of Esther was the only book not found at Qumran. Uh, they found every other book of the Bible multiple times. And uh, here we see Ahuzeras. If you want to read about Esther and Haman, you can. And uh, 464 to 423, there's another uh, guy called Artaxerxes, often called Longomanus. This is during the period of Ezra and Nehemiah when they come to Jerusalem. Ezra reads the covenant, the Torah, in 454 B.C. The people cry and repent. They have a Passover. Nehemiah resurrects the walls in 446. And uh, uh, he hangs around until about 423 B.C. But Nehemiah is the one who enforced 
uh, no foreign wives, and that was a big deal, and uh, he separates the people. 423, uh, Darius II, the Jews of Elephantine, Egypt, write a letter to Johann High Priest. This is found through secular archaeology. Then 404, 331, Artaxerxes, Arces, Darius III, rule, 331 to 323, Alexander the Great, the Greek conquest of the Levant. And, of course, the Greek language begins to replace Aramaic. So, here we go, Restoration 1. They're a kingless nation from 539 to 424 B.C. Here's the literary prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, Joel. I got a question mark there because scholars have a difficult time dating Joel. I'm throwing it in there because it applies. It could apply to the northern kingdom as well, and Malachi. Uh, Obadiah may fit in here as well, but it's a small book, but uh, nobody's really sure. Literary priests. Now, this is a, a new category. We've gone from literary prophets to literary priests. Ezra writes, Nehemiah writes, keeps a history. Ezra is a priest. He's a Levite scribe. Okay, he's going to read the law and restore the covenant, renew the covenant. They're going to eat the Passover meal. Remember, to renew the covenant, you must eat a meal. You must take communion. Nehemiah is a Kohen. He's a, high, he's a family of high priests. He was the, uh, uh, he was the uh, Cyrus's uh, um, um, uh, servant, and uh, he was commissioned to go back and to... Uh, get the thing rebuilt. It wasn't Cyrus, I think it was Darius. So he's a eunuch because he's in the palace. Restoration 2, 424 to 30 to 33 AD, it's a kingless nation, but the Messiah King arrives right on time in 30 AD, okay, the Daniel's timeline. Some people said he's the Christ, the King, the Son of the Living God. That was the confession. So he shows up right exactly according to Daniel's timeline. So at that point, literary prophecy ceases after the literary priests, of course. The narrative prophets arise. Now, narrative prophets are those that write about somebody else. They're not really literary priests. They're just narrative prophets. Very much like priests are kind of like narrative priests. So that would be Zacharias. He's a Cohen, John the Baptist's father. He goes into the holy place and burns incense and sees Gabriel. Gabriel talks to him. He comes out mute. He can't speak. Elizabeth, of course, is, is greeted by Gabriel, as is Mary. And then Anna, of course, is a prophetess who is at the temple. Uh, who uh, I believe she prophesies about Jesus and uh, when he is presented for circumcision. And so Jesus is the last prophet of the Old Testament. He's a prophet like Moses, Deuteronomy 1818. 18. And so the Messianic age begins 30 AD to 33 AD. Their king has arrived. He is going to present himself at, uh, for coronation at the temple after he and John the Baptist get the, the temple rebuilt. How do they rebuild the temple? John the Baptist turns the hearts of the fathers to the, to the sons and the sons to the father. His message is, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He starts baptizing. Baptism is not in the Old Testament. He did not know why he was going to baptize other than the Spirit told him to do it, to present the king of kings, the Shah Allah Shah. That's what king of kings means in Persian. He's going to present the Shah Allah Shah, the world emperor, the messianic king, and that is his function. And he's called the greatest of the Old Testament prophets by Jesus Christ. And so uh, restoration happens. We get a literary silence after that period. And so what happens is that there's, there's no narrative prophets uh, until 30 AD when the uh, narrative uh, begins picking up again. So we see the covenant renewal. The Passover is eaten, 454, by Ezra the priest. He's a Levitical priest, not a Kohen. The word, the Torah transmission becomes supreme. Now the Karaites, as we said, were people that were interested in the accurate trans, uh, transmission of the scriptures. They're the ones who actually penned both the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they also were the ones who established the Masoretic Text. That's a different story. We, we may have time to talk about it uh, in another lesson. Though the foreign wives are put away by Nehemiah, he builds the walls of separation, okay? And the people become as pious as they ever have been. They're probably as, as, as uh, pious to the law at this moment in time like they were when they came into uh, across the Jordan River uh, and went up against Jericho. So it looks like they're at least that morally pure at that point. Then we see that exegetical revelation prophecy occurs. In other words, the word becomes more important and revelation from the word becomes the key thing. No longer do we see signs and wonders like we see with the classical prophets of Elijah and Elisha and some of those guys. All of a sudden, instead of giving prophecy, we see this is what the prophecy means. And we see that's part of the way that God speaks to the prophet. The Greek language uh, replaces Aramaic of Babylon and Palestine. So it becomes uh, very much like English has become the world language of commerce. Greek was the world language. If you wanted to get a good job, you had to speak Greek. Uh, the New Testament, of course, uh, 
uh, uh, falls into Greek. Alexander's uh, empire disintegrates into four quadrants and then it gets consolidated into two quadrants. So the quadrant to the south was, was ruled by the Ptolemies and the Seleucids uh, ruled to the north. That would include Babylon, Syria, and the Holy Land. So the Seleucids and the Ptolemy kind of took turns dominating uh, the land, uh, the Holy Land at this time. And this is going to become very important, the Seleucid Emperor Antiochus Epiphanes. So then Jeremiah, he's, he's taken away by the Jews after the destruction of the temple down to Egypt. And this colony is very big in Alexandria. They translate the Old Testament into the Greek language called the Septuagint version. This happened during this king's reign down here in the Ptolemy reign of Philadelphus from 285 to 247 BC. And the Septuagint version is the Greek version of the Masoretic text of the Old Testament. And they wanted it in their own language because they no longer spoke Hebrew. And this is going to be important because the Septuagint is quoted exclusively in our modern New Testaments. Everything in our New Testament comes from this version. And by the way, the original version of the Septuagint has been lost. That's another story, that's another topic. But it has been lost. It is only found in the New Testament. It's been lost during the Church Age. And we'll talk about that at another time. So Antiochus Epiphanes IV, the Seleucid king. Remember Seleucid, he's from the south. And he's, he's from Egypt. He overthrows Jerusalem and he seizes the temple and the worship practices between 175 and 164 BC. And he commits the abomination of desolation as recorded in the Jewish book of the Maccabees. This fulfills Daniel 12, 11. Jesus talked about that this will be done again. But the abomination of desolation is when he set up an idol in the holy place of Zeus. But the problem was this Zeus that he set up, this statue, was actually a picture of Antiochus himself. He called himself the Son of God. This was the abomination of desolation. So many people believe that he is the type and shadow of Antichrist. Now, if the Antichrist in the end time is going to set himself up in the temple, uh, there is no temple. There will, not, well, there will be no third temple rebuilt because of the prophecy of Jesus that not one stone will be left upon another until they said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we know that the third temple will not be a physical temple. It is the church. And we will see an abomination of a desolation and idol, somebody who wants to be worshipped as the Pope, as the infallible King of Kings, somebody who is as high as God. And I think we see that already. So here we go, uh, the abomination, desolation, and uh, let's move on. Second Temple period. Here's a picture of the Second Temple. Over here the uh, was built the Antonia Fortress, and of course the Romans did this. What they kept in there was the vestments of the high priest. In other words, they controlled who would be the high priest. Like the Greeks before them, they would appoint their own high priest. And so this fortress was joined hard to the Temple Mount during the Second Temple period. Remember, I'm talking about, you know, from 150 B.C., 175 B.C. to uh, 70 A.D. And so what do we know about this? Antiochus erects a statue in the south as Zeus in the holy place. He forbids circumcision. He sacrifices pig's blood on the altar. And he is the abomination of desolation. This causes a revolt in 168 B.C. And so the pious Jews from the Cohen family, they begin to revolt. Antiochus then installs Menelaus as his own high priest. Okay? Menelaus uh, may have been from the, from the Cohen family. And, and uh, then he attacks Jerusalem. This is a Greek king, by the way, from, from Egypt. He attacks Jerusalem during the Maccabee revolt. He slaughters 40,000 people in three days in 167 B.C. And a civil war commences in Jerusalem between the traditional Cohens, the family of Aaron, the high priests, and the Hellenized priests in 168 BC. And this war concludes with the traditional Cohens, the Zedekites, are exiled to Qumran with their scrolls around 150, 155 BC. And so we can see that, that the, the Hellenized Cohens are assimilated by the Greeks. And of course, uh, then when the Romans show up, the Pharisees and the Sadducees they rise to control the temple, and they're subdued, of course, by the Romans. The Romans appoint their own uh, priests. Uh, they hold the garments, but they have to be from the family of Cohen. So they find somebody who will cooperate with them, uh, somebody like Caiaphas. And then the Romans control the temple and the high priest through the vestments, through the Antonia Fortress. So let's talk about the Zedekites and the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Zedekites retreated to the Qumran near the Dead Sea. The Maccabees write a history of the priestly civil war period. 
uh, First and Second Maccabees, those are interesting books. It focuses on Antiochus Epiphanes and the Abomination of Desolation. In the Qumran, in the caves of Qumran, 972 manuscripts have been found from 1947 to 1950. Eliezer Sukhanik, who was the chief uh, paleontologist, which means he was the the uh, chief archaeologist for reading uh, uh, old languages, uh, whether it be the Square Babylonian script or the uh, the old Phoenician script, he's he's the chief guy, and he examines the Bedouin Qumran scroll, scrolls on November 29, 1947. Now this is a key date because this is the same day that Israel and Palestine was divided by the UN. This was a big deal. This created Israel by de facto. Many people will say, well, May. May uh, uh, 14th, 1948 was when Israel was created and voted by the UN. Al contraire, November 29th, 1947, the UN, uh, UN resolution, I think it's 181, was passed. On that day, Israel recovers their scriptures, the Qumran scrolls. Isn't that interesting? Uh, three days later, 29th, 30th, and December 1st, the Muslims riot in Aleppo, Syria, and they destroyed what's known as the Aleppo Codex. This is the most ancient book containing the Masoretic text of the Karaites that went to uh, Jamnia to uh, record the scriptures up there. And so on this day, the most revered Old Testament manuscript, and it's not really a manuscript, it's a book, it's, it's a papyrus book, it's a codex. This is destroyed, it's burned, and it's torn uh, by the Muslim riots. And the, uh, the uh, imams of that particular synagogue, the uh, location, the great synagogue that was in uh, 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 Aleppo, they whipped up their followers and went out and rioted because of this thing here, because of UN Resolution 181. And they uh, burned uh, the, uh, the scrolls, uh, the, the codexes, and the, the, they tore apart the, uh, the Aleppo synagogue. So the Aleppo codex was torn when they found it at exactly Deuteronomy 28.12. If you go there, you'll find that this is the 28 curses that God, Moses, pronounces on Israel if they don't follow the law of the covenant. And so various portions of this thing have been, have been missing. They did recover some of the Aleppo Codex, and it's in Israel today. But the parts that were torn out or burned have never been recovered. And uh, these are the curses that Moses pronounced for covenant abrogation. So the Dead Sea Scrolls prove two things. Number one, they prove that God can preserve his word. And number two, that the Qumran community theology that, that existed at that time was very similar to the theology of Jesus and John the Baptist. In fact, they, scholars have been shocked that they think that Qumran was the origin of Christianity. What it simply means is that there was a, another strain of Judaism that was not taught by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was the strain taught by the Zadokites. And the Zadokites taught something that was very similar to what came about in Christianity. So let's take a look at that and uh, go to that. And that's just uh, next year. So here's their theology. The Zedekites expected the teacher of righteousness to arrive. They weren't quite sure who he was, whether he was, uh, whether he was the Messiah. They weren't sure. And they interpreted Joel 2.23 differently than the King James translators, okay, where it says early and latter rain. We'll focus on this last phrase, latter rain here. So in the uh, Joel 2.23, it says, uh, the Hebrew is Mori Zadok, when, when the King James guys translated that latter rain, they translated it, teacher of righteousness. That's the big difference. More, of course, is a derivative of Yara, which is teacher. Zadok, of course, has always been righteous, teacher of righteousness. So they said that revelation, exegesis, is a gift from God to the pious, to the godly. And so the more godly you were, the more you could see insight into written scripture. And, of course, what they did is they wrote peshers or commentaries to describe their revelation on the teacher of righteousness. So the Zedekites were actually waiting for the Holy Ghost, which was poured out on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost is the teacher. It will lead us into all truth. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter uh, 13 through 17, the reason they couldn't understand who he was because the Holy Ghost had not yet come. And he says, when he comes, he'll lead you into all truth. You'll figure out who I am when the Holy Ghost gets there. And, of course, Peter commanded uh, everybody in Jerusalem to be baptized in the name of Jesus, identifying Jesus as the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Acts 2 and 24, we see that the 2, 20, 2 4, the teacher of righteousness actually arrives. And we're going to go through these, these uh, scriptures here shortly 
and we'll look at them uh, and how they should be interpreted. So let's take a look at it. There's the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Scriptorium in Israel. You can see a man there who's actually examining them. It would be great to go there and look at them. they got a great exhibit there. So here's Joel 2.23. The King James Version says, Be glad, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain. So here you can see the word latter is more rain, Zadok, in the first month. The Qumranites, Zedekites, translated that teacher righteousness. So it's our view, that my view, that the, the Zedekites were talking about the Holy Ghost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In other words, when you receive the Holy Ghost, you will speak a language you never learned. That's the evidence of the Holy Ghost. It's the only evidence the Bible provides. Study Acts 10.46, study Acts 19.2-6, uh, through 6, and you will find out it's the only evidence that God gives that you have the Holy Ghost. And then finally it says in John 6.45, in a quotation of Isaiah 54.13, Jesus said, It's written in the prophets, They shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father comes unto me. Jesus identifies himself as that Holy Ghost. So Jesus in us is the Holy Ghost. And so we see that we are all taught by God. We have one king, the head of every man is Jesus Christ. He is the teacher. You need the Spirit to understand the Word, to get revelatory exegesis. And that's where we're going to stop tonight on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, course, the uh, 13th lesson. Um, I, I went a little quick. I hope that you enjoyed it. I, uh, I hope you see that uh, you need the Holy Ghost um, to understand your Bible, but you also need some foundational Bible knowledge too. And uh, we'll be getting our next series shortly, so stay tuned. God bless you all, and have a great day.